Ladies and gentlemen, sports fans alike, welcome to another edition of Bill Swirsky Sports Talk Chicago. One of the couple, two, three best podcasts around. So sit back, grab yourself a cold one and a pole of sausage, park your keister in the front room, and listen to Bill Swirsky Sports Talk Chicago. In Chicago, you know that all sports rock. The Bears, Hawks, Bulls, Cubs, and Sox. Pick your favorite, you can choose. As long as the Packers lose. For everything you need to know. It's Bill Swirsky Sports Talk Chicago. Bill Swirsky Sports Talk Chicago. Hey, everybody. Welcome to this week's episode of Bill Swirsky Sports Talk Chicago, aka uh, Chicago Sports and the No Good, Very Bad Week. Uh, before we jump into everything, I just want to thank the sponsor, the Rockford Ice Hogs. If you're not familiar with the Rockford Ice Hogs, they're the AHL minor league affiliate of the Chicago Blackhawks. What does that mean for you? You can see the stars of tomorrow today at family friendly, affordable prices. Tickets starting at just $10. Uh, you can afford to bring your whole family, have fun, and it is less than 90 minutes from the city limits. If you haven't been to beautiful BMO Harris Bank Center, it is a great place to see minor league hockey. I encourage you to check it out. Uh, you can head on over to icehogs.com, get a hat, shirt, jersey, season tickets, and more. Tell them Swarovski Sports sent you. Alex, on a scale of... One to ten, how bad has this week in sports sucked? I'd say fifteen, at the very yeah, least. Yeah, I'm right there with you. Yeah, I I was thinking like nineteen, but you know, it's definitely way more than ten. Oh yeah, I mean no, t- no doubt. Ugh. Yeah, the the suckage has been sucked hard, and and be between injuries and uh, people coming back from injuries that's not good for you and weather and losses and it just really added up from every direction yeah i mean it was a fitting end to this weekend with what transpired last night in northern wisconsin it kind of felt like oh they're gonna be the redeemers of this awful sports week in chicago and it ended up being the worst of it all (sighs) um do we dive into bears or will we talk a little bit? Let's just get it out of the way. Okay. Can we just get it out okay. of the way? I'm sure all of you listening have either watched the game or you've seen the highlights uh, or heard about them or read Twitter. You're, you're not in a bubble and missed everything that's happened. Um, so, you know, This is probably the reason you're listening to this show is because of that game. Yeah, this is probably the reason. And this is like, this literally is like the tale of two different games. Because the first half, you know, Bears fans were on cloud nine. Second half, just, I mean, even when we were up 20, it was still an abysmal wreck. Because uh, it's, it's official. If you are a true Chicago Bears fan... You definitely were uncomfortable as soon as you saw Aaron Rodgers warming up on the sidelines. Oh, I knew it was going to be made a game. You knew it was going to be made a game. All I kept saying was, please, Bears, score a touchdown in this drive because I think they won't put him in if they're down by 27. Right. I mean, when the injury happened to Aaron Rodgers and you saw him getting carted off, I thought, okay, even if he's not badly hurt. I questioned if he was going to come back in this game. But, you know, sure enough, he was back. And as soon as he came back, even when he wasn't healthy, even though uh, the offensive uh, line was crumbling around him because they couldn't stop the Bears' defense, you knew he was going to make it a game. And you know what? As much crap as I give Mike McCarthy, you got to give him credit. That team made adjustments in the second half. They made all the adjustments. He was firing off passes much quicker, and they didn't have time to get to him. Yeah, I mean, Mike McCarthy coached a really good game. You can, Packers fans can hate on the guy all all you want, but he really coached a good game. Um, I guess, I guess 
let's let's start with the good. Let's be positive. Let's talk about the good. Uh, the Bears' defensive line is ridiculous. Is there was pressure coming from every which way, up the middle with Roy Robertson, Harris, Akeem Hicks on the outside from uh, uh, Leonard Floyd, and of course Khalil Mack on blitzes with the very first snap Roquan Smith ever played, sack. Um, that defensive line looked great. Yeah, it did. I mean, I think that at least we got a good taste of what Khalil Mack is going to be because those two plays he made to take away the ball, those were incredible. Like, you can't deny that those were incredible, especially the one when the Packers were deep in their zone. Mack comes in, sacks him, and all of a sudden he's got the ball. Like, that was incredible. I mean, that was the best play of the he game. Just, he just – he and the best part about it was – did you see the blocking scheme that they had to stop Khalil Mack is they had somebody straight lined up across from him to chip him. And then once he beat that person, they had the off the, the tackle just dropping back ready to block Khalil Mack. So he didn't get burned around the edge. And he went through both guys, got the quarterback, just grabbed the ball, took it away. And there you go. It was, it was, I've said it before. I've said it again. Khalil Mack is a grown ass man. Yeah, he is. He is something special. And you know what? As bad as that loss was, it, it can't take away from how good he was, especially in that first half. I mean, that was that was fun to watch. And you know, at least we have the luxury of knowing we're going to have that for quite some time. Yeah, I mean, it, you know. And that first half, the Bears just dominated, you know, defensively. And um, offensively, you saw them moving the ball. You saw uh, Jordan Howard breaking off some good runs. Uh, the Bears, the Bears, well, we'll, well, let's be positive first. Let's be positive first, Alex. I could just feel the the anger seething yes, in it me. Is. And it's seething in me too. <laughs> but I'm just trying to get all the good feelings out before – so I don't want to mix my good feelings and my bad feelings. <laughs> yeah, so uh, the first half you saw, um, you know, Mitch Trubisky moving the ball. Uh, you saw the Bears just overwhelm that Packers defense. Um, everything was was going hunky dory. Uh, you know, uh, you you saw the good corner play partially because of the the pressure that. Uh, the Bears were able to put on them, but I mean, more importantly, you just saw what the the makings of what's going to be a competent NFL offense. I mean, the pieces are there, certainly. Now, regarding just the offense in general, we're going to see a lot of growing pains, and I've really tried to emphasize this because you know now they have one game under their belt, and you saw the goods and the bads. You saw how good it can be in the first quarter. You saw the talent that Trubisky has to throw to. I mean, that first quarter was really a thing of beauty. And then you saw how it could kind of go bad quickly. I mean, you know, and another positive, honestly, the a positive is, is there is definite things like uh, actionable items that you can take away from that game that you can clean up and clean up fairly easily to to make the next game that much better. Like there's honestly easy things you can you can clean up to make yourself better. And, and one of them is not playing a really good Packers defense. I mean, you know, we're just kicking ourselves in the ass. But I, I mean, I hate doing it, but you got to give Green Bay credit is Green Green Bay's got a solid team on their hands. And, They've shored up that dead defensive yep. backfield. Uh they're still able to get to the quarterback. Um they they I mean, you know, it, it it's hard to show it because Khalil Mack just dominates everybody, but they they do have a good offensive line. Yeah, they do. They do, and that's why, you know, obviously if 
They have Aaron Rodgers plus that. They're legit Super Bowl contenders and probably one of the favorites to win the Super Bowl this year. I mean, you saw how much trouble they were giving them in the second half. Yeah, I mean, they, this was this is a Bears team that drafted number seven. They were the, one of the worst teams in football last year, and they went to Green Bay week one and gave Green Bay everything that they could could handle and lost by one. I mean, you know, it sucks. It sucks to lose. But to be honest with you is, you know, take some honest inventory in yourself and ask, what was your expected result of this game? Well, if you just look at the score without any context, it was pretty much the final score. That's what I expected. I expected a good, solid game, but I really didn't think we were going to win. I wasn't expecting a 20 nothing lead and blowing it. Um, but yeah, I mean, the, it, just score-wise, that's pretty much what I expected. Uh, another positive is, um, you know, for the most part, you, you played a very clean game as far as penalties go. Yeah, that was the nice thing. Uh, la- I mean, that was the last, nice thing. Last year, is John Fox was supposed to be this disciplinarian guy, fundamentals guy, and we were just plagued with penalties. And it was, it was both sides. It was a pretty clean played game. Um, so, I mean... Granted, they didn't call a lot of holdings that were, you know, Green Bay was doing in every single play in the second half, uh, but it, you know, it was a it was a clean game, and so that's that's a positive. That's a that's a positive you take away from this game. Yeah, I mean, uh, ho- hopefully they keep that up because I really did enjoy the discipline that they had, um, and that was what was great to see in the first half because. Not only the Bears playing discipline, but, you know, Green Bay had a few bad penalties that helped him out, too. Um, nobody, uh, I don't mean, I, I, Danny Trevathan walked off on his own, I, but uh, I don't think there was any injuries in the game. Nothing serious. Um, and, and honestly, is I'm just going to put this out there. On that long touchdown pass, Kyle Fuller had pretty darn good coverage. That was that was a throw that two quarterbacks in the NFL make, Tom Brady and Aaron yeah. Rodgers. It was just a perfect. It was a perfect throw. It's yeah. That I wasn't mad about. That was just like, well, what can you do about that? Yeah, I mean, you you had good coverage. You had it was it was a great catch and an absolute perfect throw. And any anything more, you know. Kyle Fuller does, it's probably pass interference and you get it down to the one anyway and just prolongs how long, you know, by one play or two plays before you get a touchdown. But it, it was, you know, it was a perfect, absolute perfect throw and you, you got to hand it to the Green Bay Packers. Uh, you know, I'm not, I'm going to, I'm going to beat Kyle Fuller up in a little bit, but I can't beat him up about that. That no, was, it was no. pretty good defense. Uh you got any more positives? Um, I got to tell you, it's really kind of hard to try to dig for positives, but um, I mean, I would say, I mean, I guess one more. No, you go, sorry, ahead, go first. ahead first. I was just going to say is the, you know, one, one last positive I can think of offhand is, uh, you know, you, you, you look at the, the game and the end really sucked. But you you saw a lot of potential that makes you feel good for the rest of the season. This game could have could have been one where if the Bears just got routed, that it just set a sour tone for the rest of the season and turned people off. But you saw enough good things in this game. I mean, the, the second half was not one of them, but you saw enough good things that make you go, man. I want to see what they do against teams that aren't Super Bowl contenders. It's teams that are that are playoff contenders or even teams that are you know middle of the road or worse. And you're going to see the Bears. I mean, just imagine a team that sucks that is trying to block Khalil Mack. 
Khalil There's Mack no chance. had, yeah, uh, you know, so I, I just gave me hope that the Bears are going to be very, very competitive. And because they were able to do so in Green Bay week one on Monday Night Football, they were competitive with the Green Bay Packers. And that makes me feel like they can be competitive in any game in their, on their schedule. Well, I guess the way to look at it is, the way I try to see it is, if you're going to learn a lot of things and see a lot of faults and strengths and how they complement each other, this was the game because you saw your strengths and you saw what needed to be improved on and what things you need to do differently. You kind of got the best of everything. It's not like, well, everything is terrible uh, because you saw some good things. Uh, so I guess that's how I try to look at it in a positive light is that there can be a lot of lessons learned with this, the way it all played out. Learn from the first half what goes right. Learn from the second half what to do better and how to change your approach next time. That's the most optimistic thing I have to say about the game. Yeah, uh, I, I agree with you there. Uh, let's move to the other side of the coin here. The negatives. Where to start here? I'm going to put my starter at the uh, Leno, Charles Leno. He sucked ass. There was constant pressure from that side all night long. Constant pressure. And I know he's going up against Clay Matthews, but there was constant pressure. Is that pocket collapsed really quickly? Is you've got a young quarterback. It's going to, he's not going to, when you look at Aaron Rodgers, Aaron Rodgers knows this offense like the back of his hand. He's played in it for how many years now? He knows it. It's like Tom Brady knows his offense. It's like Peyton Manning knew his offense. It's it's old hat. And, but with uh, Mitch Trubisky, this is not old hat. This is a brand new system. He's still a young quarterback, and he's still feeling his way. The game moves is, is, you know, I'm sure it slowed down some, but it hasn't slowed down anywhere near the, the level of, you know, how slow it is for Tom Brady or Aaron Rodgers. And when you've got Clay Matthews and, you know, some of those other defenders bearing down on you and the pocket is collapsing, it makes the game an awful lot faster. So people are, are knocking it uh, for you know, overthrowing in the end zone or missing an open receiver. Uh, you know, should he make those throws? Yes. Will he make those throws at the end of the season? You hope so. But first game of the season and you've got the pocket collapsing regularly, I I'm not going to, I'm not going to beat him up. I'm not going to, I'm going to be, a, you know, the offensive line, the offensive line as a whole, especially Charles Leno, underperformed in that game. I can't disagree with you there, especially later in the game. You saw him with more and more pressure as the game went on. Uh, that that made a big difference. Um, another, another uh, you know, blame I'm going to throw out there is Matt Nagy. Yeah. Um, you know. Play calling if, I thought was atrocious in the second half. I'm just going to be blunt. I thought it was terrible. Uh, I'm I'm gonna say that it, it after the first quarter it got worse. Um, he he was trying to do too many cute things, uh, too many bubble screens. Um, I, I think he needed to move the ball down the field. I don't think he understood what it's like to face Aaron Rodgers when when he's within a touchdown and has the ball in his hands. I don't think Matt Nagy knew what to expect. And, but to be honest is he's going to have growing pains too. It's the first. Yes, he know, is. Uh, you know, he's got limited experience play calling, but I, I think I read it from two Bill Polian, I think said it and somebody else I read said it is Matt Nagy is going to be a great head coach and the bears probably grabbed him a year too soon 
but it's better to get him a year too soon than miss out on him. And I have a feeling that this year you're going to have some growing pains on his part as well, and you saw some of them last night. Um, I think for me, the uh, the worst of the sequences was when you had it down, you know, right around the red zone with two and a half minutes left, and it's third and he called it third and two. It was more like third and a long one. But you have Green Bay with no timeouts left. No timeouts. Run the ball twice. You run the first time. You bring it down to the two-minute warning. And you run it again. And, you know, Green Bay has to basically, if you don't get that first down, if you get the first down, you win the game. They can't stop the clock. But if you don't get the first down, you can't get one one long yard on two runs, then you know, you you put it on your defense, but it's at that point, you know, what do you you're at a minute forty with no timeouts, having to go eighty yards? It it puts a lot of pressure on Green Bay. And it, you know, the Bears threw a pass. It killed the clock, and then they kicked a field goal. So that puts you up six. And you knew as soon as they went up six, you knew Rodgers was going to come right back. Everybody knew it. Yeah. So that that upset me about uh, the the play calling. Um, there was there was a time when you knew Aaron Rodgers was coming back, and you knew you had to have long like a long offensive series one to give your defense a rest two is to run time off the clock three to try to put up as many points as possible because they're coming from behind and if you can just keep padding it even at the end if you could have just gotten field goal field goal field goals um you know it, it, it at least takes it adds more pressure to Green Bay every time you score a field Especially goal. Especially since some you know, of those drives were so short, you couldn't burn any clock with them. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, you were able to run the ball pretty well. Is I feel like he got away from the run too much. And, um, you know, I, I just felt like you didn't take advantage of your offensive weapons downfield enough. Yeah, no, I totally agree. I totally agree. You were wondering many times in the game, like, why aren't they using Jordan Howard? Where is he? And again, here you go with a lot of the bubble screen stuff. And I'm like, oh, no, no, no trust mini stuff here, please. No. But yeah, I, I was really, really stumped at that third and one play. If you could have just pounded Howard through and ended the game there. I, I didn't get that. But again, I hope it's just kind of a lesson learned blip for Matt Nagy. I, I really do. Uh, another thing I saw multiple times. Um, God, I think the airplane's crashing into my house. Yeah, if you don't if you don't know already, I, I live uh, on the northwest. <laughs> I live on the northwest side of the city in the shadow of O'Hare. Uh, and I have my windows open because it's I got mine too, yeah. Upstairs. Uh, and you could that plane i swear just like you know breezed over my house um but another thing that kind of drove me nuts and matt nagy's got to work on is when it's sh third and short they know you're running you know you're running and you're just going to play smash mouth football you can't call run plays that are slow developing plays it's got to be it's got to be something quick 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 Bang bang, because you don't have a lot of time. The longer the longer the play takes to develop, the the better likelihood that the defense has of stopping you. The faster you hit that play, the more likely you are to get that that yardage you need. And there was a couple of times when it was a slow developing run, and you know we would have been much better served having a lead fullback and just done doing a handoff to the fullback. Or a quarterback sneaking it, you're, you're better off. Faster developing plays, hitting the hole, and getting that yardage. 
Yeah, right on. Uh, let's see. Other bad stuff. Deion Sims. Holy oh. crap. Oh. Stone hands. He, and Stone the, hands. The one play that that stood out to me, it was in the first half. He got a pass, you know, towards the edge, and he tried to deke, and he didn't get the first down. If he would have just gone straight, he would have got the first down. Do you know what play I'm talking about? Yep, definitely. And it had that weird behind angle, you know what I mean? But, yeah, he he just had to run straight. Yeah, it, it, it's – honestly, don't be shocked if that Deion Sims doesn't get cut when – when uh, Adam Shaheen comes back, this is the reason you wanted Adam Shaheen is he's a big target, good hands, faster is that's the type of things you're expecting from him. And, you know, Deion Sims really sucked. And I felt that that Daniel Brown or Ben Broniker probably could have been better targets there. Um, you know, you've, <laughs> You know, I thought Kevin White could have been a better target there. Yeah, where was he? He just didn't even show up. Um, Where was... I mean, I knew... I'm like, is he on the roster? Is he there? I I know he's not hurt right now. Where is he? Honestly, I don't know if they put him on the the active roster for the game. He's on the 53, but I don't know if he was on the active game day roster. Uh, I mean, I didn't see him. I, I, his name wasn't even mentioned on the broadcast. Um, another one that really frustrated me is Green Bay went at Nick Kwiatkowski because he's slow. Why didn't you have Roquan Smith out there? Because he's a whole hell of a lot faster than Nick Kwiatkowski. This is what I was wanting to ask this whole show. And... This whole limiting idea. Why? It's the regular season. Your first round pick should not be limited. He is your first round pick. He should be in there. That's inexcusable. I I mean, if you're trying to send a message to him and punish him, it really backfired. It really backfired. That's ridiculous. That's ridiculous. You should not be playing discipline because of a holdout contract. He is here. You are supposed to be winning football games. Get him on the field. Get him playing. He needs to be on Monday night. He needs to be in the lineup. He needs to be right there starting in inside linebacker. Period. Period. No excuses. None. That really pissed me off. Is he... I mean, and I'm not even going to beat up Nick Wachowski is it just, he was overmatched. He was, he was, they went at him and he wasn't fast enough to do what he wanted to do. And, you know, Roquan Smith is a lot faster, has a lot better instincts, a lot stronger and is a better linebacker. And, And that's, you know, Hunter Hillenmeyer was a nice, a nice player, but was he Brian Urlacher? No. No, he wasn't. Kwiatkowski is there for depth and for backup. He shouldn't be out there for a majority of the game against Green Bay. And look, I don't care if it's week one. I don't care. It's a big divisional matchup. Now, if Matt Nagy came out and said that they were concerned about a health issue, that's completely different. But that's the only excuse you should have in this situation. And I don't care if he wasn't there for a lot of camp or some of the preseason. He is your first round pick. Uh, Can you tell him a little frustrated with that? I I don't blame you. I honestly don't blame you. Is that that needs that, you know, the Bears coaching staff needs to answer for that. Yeah, I, 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 I'd love to just respectfully ask Nagy, why wasn't Roquan Smith in the game? His first play as an NFL player, did you see how quick he was? It was great. Can you imagine how great you can have of a linebacking core when you have 
Khalil Mack and Roquan Smith. You saw what they did. It's I. You you got to have your first round pick in there. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Uh. No, that that angered me more than almost anything. And again, like you said, this is no disrespect to Kwiatkowski, but who's the more talented guy and who is going to be one of the three key anchors on the defense? Roquan Smith. Another thing that pissed me off about the game is in the second half, Aaron Rodgers made an or Aaron Rodgers and the Green Bay Packers made an adjustment, a lot of quick passes, and the Bears were not able to respond. And that's on Vic Fangio. That's on the Bears defense. Um, you know, the the safety the safety play was pretty bad in that game. The safety play was pretty pretty bad. Uh, the the all the secondary all the Bears defensive backs took bad angles. Um, they, they were trying to make jumps on plays rather than, uh, defend it or make the tackle. There was a lot of missed tackles. Safety play was bad. And the bears, uh, play calling on defense in the second half is they didn't blitz enough. Aaron Rodgers was clearly not mobile. So why not make him really uncomfortable? You had Khalil Mack, who clearly was gassed by the end of the, you know, in the second half of the game. And you, you know, you need to get to him. So, you know, blitz the guy. Blitz That's, him. Uh, if nothing else, if nothing else is, uh, you know, you knock him down a few times and make him question standing in that pocket. Well, that's the thing. I'm like, why don't you just keep blitzing when the most talented quarterback of all time is not 100% with the legs? I mean, look, you can we can say that the defense is going to be really good because I think it is. But I think that this game also showed that there is going to be some holes in that secondary. And if you're not able to get to the quarterback there's going to be some problems. The reason why this defense is going to be good is because your front seven should consistently have pressure on the quarterback. And honestly, the front seven usually makes corners anyway. Um, but, you know, you've got to be able to hold your own when they're not getting pressure. And right. some of those big pass plays that were given up were were just ridiculous. Um, I mean, Eddie Jackson, Kyle Fuller, Prince of Mukamara, uh, Adrian Amos, all of them made bad plays. All of them. Yeah, it, it just it, it looked ugly in the secondary. That's gonna that's gonna be another big work in progress. Um, Cody Whitehair at center. I still think it's a terrible idea. How many bad snaps do you have to have before mm. you put a guy in who's a center to play center? I didn't get that one either, especially towards the end there. Those were some not so great snaps. Uh, um, you know, we can beat up on, on Mitch Trubisky a little bit is, you, you know, you've got to be able to move the ball downfield. And I get it. The Green Bay secondary is a lot improved from last year and the pockets collapsing a little bit, but you've got to find your hot receiver. And you've got to make throws. There's no matter how good a defense is, there's an offensive play to beat that defense. And you don't, you shouldn't have any hole, glaring holes on offense that prevent you. If, uh, you know, if you need a power running game, you've got the center of your offensive line and Jordan Howard should be able to handle that. If it's a um, hot receiver, you know, running it, quick slant route is you've got Taylor Gabriel. You've got Anthony Miller. You've got, uh, um, what's his face that you got from the Eagles? Uh, Trey Burton. Um, who again, you utilized in the first quarter nicely. Yeah. You, the, their defensive backs are not that good that they should have taken away everybody. They just, no, especially talented targets like those guys. Um, if 
if they're playing you man to man, uh, you know, you've got then it means you've got a one on one matchup with Allen Robinson. Just take advantage of it. Take advantage of whatever that they're get the defense is giving you. Take advantage of it. And I feel like they didn't do that. And Mitch Trubisky, you know, missed missed some guys. And he's uh the game, the game's gotta slow to start slowing down for him. And I, you know, you saw the confidence in him, but you've got to be able to find that open man. And if that takes that one extra read, you know, look off one more receiver is, uh, you know, you got to be able to do it. And you could watch him when they did replays of him scanning the field. And then when he dis- he made eyes with his target, he locked on. He didn't look off that target. And that – that's going to get your say uh, us, you know, your middle linebackers and your safeties coming at you. And that just makes it a harder throw is, you know, once you either got to make a quick throw, once you read that target, or you've got to look it off again before you go back to it. Uh, that's, that's just the NFL. It's a, too fast of a game for you to stare down a receiver. Yeah. That said it perfectly. But I mean, you got to kudos him is, you know, when was the last time we played the Green Bay Packers and didn't throw at least one interception? I couldn't tell you. Um, we didn't have any turnovers in that game, so I guess that's a positive. Yeah. He didn't um, turn the ball over. There's always one painful turnover in one of those games. Yeah, but uh, another big painful spot is if this was a lovey coach defense, Kyle Fuller would have caught that ball and ended the game. That one hurts the most, and I can't really break it down or give a lot of opinions other than he just didn't catch it. That That's it all is, I got. A Lovey Smith defense would have, they would have licked their chops, and, you know, the cornerback would have caught it, and every single other player on that defense would have just hit somebody forming a wall to to try to score. And that's one thing about Vic Fangio's defense is they don't take the ball away a lot. Uh, you you know? No, they don't. Uh, during the preseason, Prince of Mukamara talked about how he was going to get 10 interceptions this year, which I think is more than his entire career combined. And, you know, he didn't get one. And Kyle Fuller could have had one, an easy one, and that would have that would have just – ended that game and made the Packers fans feel as miserable as we feel yep. right now. Yep. It would have been, it would have been the complete role reversal where the game ended by their quarterback throwing an interception when he's trying to score on a game winning drive. Yep. That's what may that in my opinion is what really made this painful. It would have been painful losing no matter what, but it's one thing if you just get flat out beat, and it's the other if you have victory in your hands and you can't hold on. That's that, in my opinion, is what made this loss so bad. Was that one play? It, it just it sucks to say, but it's kind of how I feel. You just wonder is is losing this way going to be a motivating factor enough for to make the Bears better or? would have winning this game been a momentum shift that helped them win more? Like, do you think they're a better team by just being that close to victory and, and losing it? Or or do you think that they're better off long run by tasting victory and learning how to beat Green Bay and Green Bay? Well, uh, I mean, that's a tricky question. I think that learning as much as you can right now while your team is young is the best. And, you know, maybe in the long run, this does benefit you um, in a number of ways because you can really identify things and work on it, like I said earlier. So, I I don't know. That's kind of a tough question. If you're looking long term, I mean, obviously, everyone will tell you, as they should, it's better to win the game than to lose the game. Yeah, I'm gonna, I'm definitely going to give you that. It's always better to win the game. Um, but 
I, I just I just hope that it leaves. I just worry that if my hope is that you know that the Bears would have been cocky, a little too cocky if they had won, and and you know overlooked opponents, and now that they they had victory and they they got it snatched out of their their grasp, that. They're gonna. Everybody's gonna take a deeper look inside and say, "I don't like the way that felt. I, I want to win, and it's gonna make them hungrier." That's my hope. Yeah. You know who knows. You know, I think everybody's a little different, but uh, everybody said the right things after the game, and you know, honestly, Akeem Hicks said, you know, said it really well. Is you know, it sucked. We're going to go back. We're going to look at the film. We're going to figure out the things that we did wrong and clean them up. And and that's really all you can do. Yeah. Right on. I mean, that's all you can hope for. Somebody on Twitter was saying, I know this is probably what you don't want to hear, but we looked at the upcoming schedule and there are some matchups that you figure the Bears in this, you know, what they have right now should be able to win, um, especially this upcoming game against the Seahawks. You should hopefully win that game. They're not the old Seahawks anymore. They don't have a line. And with the defense that the Bears have, you should be able to have pressure on uh, Russell Wilson the whole game. So... I'll be more worried if, in the long run, if they don't beat some of these teams now that they should be beating because they are at a point where there are matchups they clearly have the advantage in. And with Russell Wilson being as mobile as he is, if Nick Kwiatkowski is out there when Danny Trevathan and Roquan Smith are healthy, then I'm going to lose it. I'm going to launch myself through my television and punch somebody. Yeah, that would, uh, it would almost be so bad, but at the same time, so very bears. <laughs> um, another thing that really made me mad too is Clay Matthews at the end of the game, just cheap shotted, uh, Mitch Trubisky. And, and that was, that was just not becoming of a veteran that's been in the league that long. When, when, it, I mean, I'm assuming that it was they got his guy. He's got to get their guy, but it was not a cheap shot where Aaron Rodgers got injured. It was it was a clean play. It just his leg got twisted underneath somebody. It was a clean play, and you know there were multiple late hits on Mitch Trubisky, and that's just that's just not classy football. And it really sucks that it really sucks that Green Bay tried to go that route. And, you know, it also sucks that they couldn't take advantage of that. But, you know, I guess you got to move on. It would have been really fitting if, uh, you know, the Bears gave up the lead and marched on the field and scored, aided by a Clay yeah. Matthews penalty. That would have just been – that would have been yeah. very savory. It, it would have, but it didn't happen. That's that is what that is what I was really, really, really hoping for is that they could take advantage of that. And then not only would the Bears win, but it would shed some light on those plays. But it didn't happen. So no one's going to really talk about it. Yeah, but you you look at the, the game film and you've got to tighten some things up. Is Harry he stands got a lot to work, you know, a lot of work he's got to do with his guys. Um, you know, Matt Nagy's got to be able to offer help on the the left side of the line if Leno's getting beat up. Um, you know, you, you can't be cute on everything. You've got to be able to you've got to be able to pound the ball. You've got to be able to when you've got a lead keep hammering it is Bill Belichick Bill Belichick if he's if he's would have coached the Bears and they're up by 20 of course not. they don't lose because he's going to put the pressure on them 
and he's going to keep scoring and he's going to, and this is the NFL is you see what happens is, you know, so you, you score as many points as you can. Yeah. I mean, you had to keep scoring last night and somebody pointed, somebody pointed, and somebody pointed out that uh, in a, a game against the Colts when it was a, basically a shootout and uh, he, Bill Belichick didn't want to give the ball to Peyton Manning at the end of the game <clears throat> is uh, he was in a similar situation to the Bears and he just pounded the ball because he was like, you know what, if I'm giving it back to him, He's like, I'm putting every effort to to run the clock out and try to run for this first down. And if Bill Belichick is going to try to do that in that situation, um, he's a hell of a coach. Is maybe maybe Matt Nagy doesn't go. I'm going to pass for it. Again, this is something that I hope he learns for the future. I mean, I know you're only going to face. Hall of Fame quarterbacks every now and then, but you're still going to face a lot of offenses that are not going to give up after one half. So you got you got to keep the uh, the foot on the gas pedal, especially in these situations. Um, luckily, he got a good dose of that. He got exactly what could happen in a situation like that. And you know what I hope as a whole that this is the rock bottom of the Nagy era and that it could only go up. That's my hope. And honestly, if this is the lowest, it really hurt and it really sucked. But the reason that it hurt and it sucked is because we felt hope. Yeah. If we would have lost like this uh, with John Fox, we would have all been excited because we're like, oh man, we really played the Green Bay Packers tough, but we th- saw victory in this game. That is called hope. Hope made it more painful because we thought we had it. That's where it hurts, and that's that's a good thing. Is it hurts right now? But you know, you you look at fans of of the Patriots and fans of the Packers and fans of these teams that are just really good and good for a while is they just expect victory. They expect it. And we don't do that. We expect we expect something bad to happen and expect a loss and expect to be miserable at the end of the game. And we have a baseline level of misery. And because we had so much hope in this game based on things we saw is we got our hopes up and then it came crashing down. But the fact that we had hope from something we saw on uh, during the game with our eyes is is something to go hey i like the way hope feels i like the you know being sensing that we're going to win i like that i want more of that and i want and i'm excited that you know in one game matt nagy was able to give that to us we, i had more hope in that one game than i did in 3 years of john fox yeah, no, I hear that. I do. I'm trying to really look at the positives here. And, you know, if, if this is what... This is what they got going for them, and they can only get better, then, yeah, you're going to see some really good things. I think that if they start beating some of the teams they should beat, they're going to get a little more confidence all across the board. And, and honestly is, uh, you know, Minnesota looks for real, but the Lions, the Lions are struggling right now against the Jets. So, you know what? You take that. You take that and you take it to the Lions. And, you know, you're going to have a tough game against Minnesota because that's, that's a, a really good, good team. team. And they address, they address their biggest need, which was to upgrade a quarterback. And they did so. And... You know, they've, that's defense looks legit and you're going to have to really prepare and you're going to have to be, you know, ready to play. But, you know, there are a lot of other teams is you play Green Bay one more time and you play Minnesota twice. That's three games. Um, You know, you've got, you've got 12 other games that you're going to be playing against teams you feel confident against. Yeah. 
that's why that's why I think that this team has the potential of being around eight and eight because there will be games they clearly have the upper hand matchup wise and should win, but there are still plenty of other teams that have an up on them, both talent wise and experience wise. Um, and a lot of that is in our own division. So, you know, like I said, just keep building from there. It's really, really hard still to just really try to feel good about this. It's hard. I mean, look, look, look at the other games they're playing. You take away the Packers, you take away the, the Vikings. Um, you've got Seahawks. You feel like you could that's a that's a winnable game. Cardinals, you feel that's a winnable game. Is you get the Buccaneers back, and that's gonna be the first game with um you know, with Lobster McSteely and back from suspension. Uh you got the Dolphins. You, you can't be that scared of the Dolphins. Patriots, it's gonna be a tough one. You got the Jets, you got the Bills. The Bills looked terrible. Um you got the Lions twice you get the giants the eli looked terrible you know odell beckham and saquon barkley look good but uh eli looked terrible i i, I think he's i mean i think he's done uh you got the rams that's gonna be a tough one and you got the 49ers yeah. who definitely look yeah beatable. i mean i i don't want i i don't want to like totally say the 49ers aren't good now, but you know, I I think that they have more problems than people realize. Yeah. I'm not saying every one of those games is the bears are going to win. I'm just saying is those are games you go in and you go, Hey, I have to feel really confident in myself. Um, it's not like when you go against the Patriots and you're just like, Oh God, how bad are we going to get beat? Um, you you look at those games and you're like, I th- legitimately think yeah. that we could win this game. Uh, so let's quickly talk White Sox. You know, Michael Kopech was looking good and is going to need Tommy John. So you're going to lose him basically all of next season. And that really sucks. It sucks for the organization because you already started the clock on your years of control, so you're losing a year of year year of control for an injury. Uh, it sucks for Michael Kopech because you know you're a young guy and you finally get up to the majors and you you you, know, you got to start feeling confident because you're pitching well and just you know a bad break and you're you're derailed for a year. Well. Here's the good news. If I'm going to shed some good news here. He's incredibly young. He's getting the surgery out of the way now. The way he works and the way that Tommy John's surgery is no longer a death sentence. He could come back stronger. And really the projected time for the White Sox to be good. or I mean, they should be much better next year. But contending for a World Series, the goal was kind of 2019. So, or uh, 2020, I'm sorry. So if he comes back 2020, that should be when the White Sox are in contention for World Series. So I don't think it sets back the rebuild as a whole in any way, shape, or form. It stinks for him, believe me, and it stinks for White Sox fans, but it doesn't ruin the whole picture. It, that, that's the positive spin I'd put on it. But yeah, it's a real tough blow for the White Sox regardless. Yeah, I talked to my buddy Gary a bunch about it, and you pretty much mirrored his sentiments about it is it sucks, but you know, he's going to come back and it'll be much closer to when the white Sox are going to compete. Um, it, it just sucks because I feel like next year could be a year that they really surprise people. You look at the division and um, you know, it, it's, Indians are running away with it, and you feel like they're going to win it next year too. But you really feel like you could you could take second place next year, and if you're in second place, yeah, then you think wild card. And if 
you know, I, I know those are high expectations, uh, but just, you know, these, you turn the corner in major league baseball real quick. You always turn it, you know, a little like a year sooner than you usually think if you're a, you know, a decent market team. Uh, the Cubs took, uh, rounded the corner a year sooner than they thought. Atlanta's rounding it qu quicker than they thought. And and you would have hoped the White Sox could have done that too. This this just sort of sets that back. It's you know keeps them on the the trajectory that most people kind of expected is twenty twenty. But I think if he he would have been healthy and you bring up Eloy next year, then uh, it, it it would have it would have set things in motion and they would have been a lot more competitive. I mean, look, they're playing five hundred baseball right now, and going into the season. You know the way they played, you would have never expected that. And you add Kopech, you add Eloy Jimenez, and uh, you know you got to feel really confident that you can keep 500 baseball for a whole season. So it just sucks for next year, but you know what? That just should make 2020 even sweeter for White Sox fans. Yeah, no, absolutely, absolutely, and you just hope he gets. Uh well in the scheduled time, which I'm sure he will. He'll be uh, watched over very closely. Uh, so speedy recovery to Michael Kopech. <sighs> so let's talk Cubs. Yeah. Yeah, so they're playing lousy. And what makes it worse is the weather stopped them from getting bottom of the rotation guys and makes them have to uh, lose their, their last day off in the regular season and have to face Max Scherzer again. Well, the Brewers seem to just be on all cylinders. Yeah. I mean, right now, I, we're recording this on Monday, and it's the fifth inning, and they're they're winning. They're winning against the Cubs, and Cubs sent John Lester to the mound, and uh, you know, if if honestly, if you're the Cubs, you you hope for a sweep in this three game series, but uh, if you could win two of three, you got to feel real confident then about going forward, but. You know, winning that first game is the biggie. Yeah, that sets the tone for the, the rest of the three game series. Yeah, I just, I you could be listening to this and they have an amazing comeback win. I don't know, but uh, you know, right now, it's uh, it, it's getting a little rough. And part of me just can't be mad because they've played so much baseball. They've got to be exhausted. I mean, this is this is a really tough stretch that they're going through right now. Yeah, it's it's a tough stretch, and you know we're we're coming down to the the wire here. Um, what do the Cubs have like twenty games left? Around there. Um, so you've only got a couple weeks left of baseball. Is this is the time that you've got to catch fire? This is the time you've got to put away Milwaukee is you don't want to be battling them the last weekend of the season because guess what? Is Do you want the St. Louis Cardinals being the barrier between you and making the playoffs? Nope. I mean, you, nope. you know, the Cubs, I think at this point, are almost a lock to make the playoffs, but you don't want to play that wild it's card. It's like 99.8%. Yeah, you don't want to you don't want that wild card. You want the division no, win. Oh. No. And if you don't want St. Louis to be what separates you from going winning the division. You don't want that because that's when they dig in their heels and just play lights out. Right. I I mean a few there two wins. Two wins. If you could have taken that second game of the doubleheader against the Washington Nationals and that very important first game against the Brewers in that last series, th that could have made a huge difference. You got to imagine 
that everything else that they've done would have been enough, but the way the Brewers are playing might not be. I mean, again, it's a tough stretch, and they've played a lot of baseball, and they've gone through some good stretches, but you don't want them to hit a slump at just a terrible time because that can make or break a season. Yeah, honestly, I agree with you. You said it perfectly. It's uh, you just hope that the Cubs can do Cubs things. It's just it's so frustrating. Yeah, it's absolutely frustrating, and um, you know, you just hope that they can come back, win this game, and and be a dagger to the Brewers because the the Brewers, you know, their their confidence is sky high. And they feel like they can come in here and sweep the Cubs, and oh yeah, they're they're on cloud nine right now. They're they're rolling. And I, I you know, and you you would hope that Lester pitching would have been something that could break that confidence, come in here and just steamroll them. But that's just not the that's not what's happening. We got to score off Wade Miley that, for starters. I mean that's a that's a definite. You gotta you gotta do that. Yeah. Uh, and um, you know you you get the news that uh, you know probably not that likely you're gonna get Brandon Morrow back. Um, Th- that that hurts. That hurts. Uh, Smiley, not gonna be ready to to help you out. Um, and I didn't think he would at this point. I, it seemed like a wait till next year type deal. I mean, I think, think that's the reason that they signed him is for next year. But I think yeah. the hope was you could you could get him back at the end of the season and have him be impactful for at least the, if nothing else the stretch run. Um, but that's just not going to be the case, and it's going to be for 2019. Uh, so you know the the Cubs. The Cubs aren't getting a ton of good news, um, and they're just going to have to manufacture their own good news, to be honest with you. Yeah, it's, again, it's their fate. They control it. If they win, it's because they did what they were supposed to. If they didn't, now, then they have no one to blame themselves, and you give credit to Milwaukee. Yeah, I mean, you know, Milwaukee, Milwaukee came in, they bolstered their their lineup um in the trade deadline they you know they bolstered it in the offseason i didn't think it was enough they bolstered it at the trade deadline they bolstered it at the the waiver deadline and they they're playing great baseball you mm-hmm. you, you got to hand it to them um you just hope that the the cubs can get things rolling uh you know, you you haven't seen you haven't seen them play their best baseball much at all this season. Uh, you've seen games where offensively they've carried the load. You've seen games where the pitching carried the load, but when the bats were good and the pitching was good, you don't see a lot of those games. You haven't seen a lot of it. No, y- yeah, it's you just wanted them to hit another good stride down the stretch here because when they hit a good stride, they're incredibly hard to beat uh, I don't know if there's anything else you want to talk about um no not really it's kind of been a frustrating week yep uh hopefully when we talk next week that the Cubs have really padded that lead um and the Bears have knocked off Seattle and uh you know, we go from there. Yep. Uh, so I want to thank everybody so much for listening. Um, you can follow us on social media at shy fan, Pat one at Swirsky sports, facebook.com slash Swirsky sports, Swirsky sports.com. Uh, make sure you hit subscribe. However you listen to podcasts, whether it's iTunes, Stitcher, YouTube, or the tune in app. And your homework for this week is to share this podcast with one friend that listens to or that likes Chicago sports uh, to help grow this audience. Um, again, 
Thank you guys so much for listening. And until next time, bear down. Smoking crack is not legal on the planes. Bears 31, the negative 7. The Bears. Oh, when the Bears go bearing down.